love that. A joyful duty. And this is, you know, we think about worshiping God. Every creature on earth is obligated. It's a duty that we worship the Lord, that we give him what he's worthy of. But what we discover as Christians is in coming to the Lord to do that, that there's nothing greater. It's actually what we were made for. And that to, to, ful- to really be satisfied and fulfilled to the highest degree possible, we have to. You have to know the Lord and to worship him as the greatest, the most wonderful, the most glorious being that exists because that's who he is. And it's our privilege this morning to, to give him that praise. We're going to continue to do that by singing 272. Uh, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Let's hear God's word. This is uh, chosen for us this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, is a revelation of God's will for us. Hear God's word. Every commandment, commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these forty years. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Amen. This is God's word. Please be seated. Young people here might know Jesus quoted from that section of Deuteronomy, right? You've probably heard about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, and as before he enters into his ministry, and he, he goes into the, the wilderness just like, just like Israel was. 
when they were brought out of Egypt. To be humbled and tested by the Lord that he might see what was in their heart, what was in Jesus' heart when he was hungry in the wilderness and was tempted and he suffered. His word, the word of God was in his heart. He responded in every temptation with the word of God as his strength as his life. He, he was the living illustration of the very thing that the Lord said there in Deuteronomy, that man shall not live by bread alone, that man lives by the word of God. Have you guys discovered that? And this is, the wonder, this is the wonder, one of the wonderful things about God and his word is that Everything that happens, everything that falls out in this world happens by the word of God. Everything goes according to his word. Even the evil things that we see in this world that we experience in our own lives, the, the things that Israel experienced. The Lord said, I, I took you into that because he had a good purpose through it to accomplish something holy and awesome and wonderful to lead people closer to him. And we, uh, we need to see day by day just how badly we need God's word, that we would live on it and feed on it. We're going to take a moment just now to confess our sin to the Lord. In this, I'll give you uh, some time for silent prayer. Let's pray. ask, Lord, that you would lead us to repentance. Father, that we would turn from living according to our own word and our own way, and that we would each one come longing to hear what you have to say and to have our steps directed by the knowledge of you and the truth of your word in the life that is found in your Son, Jesus Christ. We th thank you, Father, that you come to humble us. Let us see what is in our hearts, and let us turn to you, Lord, knowing that you have promised that you will receive each one that comes to you. will not turn anyone away. Lord, let us come willingly and joyfully. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Here... Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. This is a wonderful place in Scripture to turn when you're thinking about uh, sin and um, the reality of it in your own life, in your own heart. And the Lord doesn't want us to despair. He wants us to see our sin. He wants us to be real about our sin. And then he wants us to see what he has, has done for us in his son, Jesus Christ. And this is a reminder of that grace that we have in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says, There is... Therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen? If you are in Christ, what does he mean by that? In Christ. If, you're, if, your, life is, if your life comes from Christ, if your salvation comes from Christ, you have been united to Jesus Christ by faith, and he is your life, the living word, the son of God, and he's given himself to us. He's also given to us Psalm 103. In Psalm 103, you, if you want to use the hymnal, turn to 103C. We're going to sing together uh, the first, um, Don, how many stanzas are there on that first page? Uh, just the, we're just going to sing the first page. 103C. There's four. Okay, just the first four. Um, <clears throat> but the Lord has given us this psalm 
to show us um, how we should come to him when we come to him in, in humility and then to hear from him uh, what he is for us uh, when we come to him confessing our sin. So let's pray. Sing this together. Come, my soul, and bless the Lord. yourself, you know what we just saying is really good news. It's really good news, and it gets even better. As we heard in our call to worship this morning, we're supposed to draw near with a full assurance of faith, trusting that the Lord uh, welcomes us is to into the holiest place, into his inner sanctuary, into his house, really. And there, as our Father, us, his children, gathered around uh, his table, he wants us to pray and to seek his grace, seek his face, and to enjoy fellowship with him. We're going to do that together just now. Um, An update on prayer uh, for uh, Don's wife, Colleen. She was um, treated earlier in the week after uh, passing out. And she fell and hit her head, so she's she's sore. Uh, the doctors, as I said in the email, um, know that she has an enlarged heart. Um, but thankfully, uh, Don says that they think that this episode was caused by uh, a medication that they can adjust and that she's already feeling better. So we're thankful for that. We, we want to continue to pray for uh, her relief and her healing as well. Uh, are there other things that uh, some someone else shared some prayer requests with me this morning as well um, that I'll be praying for? Is there anything else that we can remember in prayer now? Yes, sir. Yes, let's pray for Janet and a port replacement. That's an outpatient surgery. 
Okay. Good. Anything else? All right. Very good. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, thank you for coming to encourage us today to take our confidence in you. And we need you to wean us off of this world and the things that we take refuge in and the maybe institutions or people or powers that that we look to for uh, help and for salvation when we should be looking to you. And we thank you, Father, that uh, you're teaching us day by day how to how to follow you. I thank you, Lord, for the Lord's Day and for our worship here that uh, where you have uh, promised to to speak to us and to give faith. And Father, we pray that we would abound in faith and that our faith working by love would uh, would glorify you. It would bless our fellowship and strengthen it. And Father, we want to pray for our brothers and sisters who are uh, still at home worshiping. We put, lift up to you Bob and the Johnsons and the Pangburns and Janet and Ben. Father, we... we Pray that you would care for them and nurture them, um, and we pray that you would make a way, Father, for us all to come back together again. And we ask, Father, that you would be with Janet as she uh, goes in to have this procedure done. We pray for it would be successful. Father, we ask that uh, she would recover from uh, the treatment this past week, give her strength for the work that you have called her to do. Now, Father, we thank you for Colleen and the answer to prayer that she is on the mend and that uh, she's being treated. We thank you, Father, that she's feeling better, and we pray um, that she would uh, res- fully recover from her fall, and we ask, Lord, that uh, you would encourage her, draw her to your son, Jesus Christ, that she might uh, know him as he has revealed himself in the gospel. And Father, we ask that you would be with Orville. We continue to lift him up to you. We pray um, as he waits surgery that um, he would not fear. Uh, Lord, that his faith would strengthen day by day. We want to uh, pray for Randy's daughter Stephanie and her husband David, and we pray that the adoption of Raiden, that the papers would um, go through and that the progress, that everything would come together and that uh, you would strengthen them as a family, give them all that they need, Lord, to grow in grace. We we thank you for Aaliyah, that she is making strides, strides in um, areas of her life where she has been bound by addiction. And, Father, we, we thank you for her being able to quit smoking. And we thank you, Father, that she's, again, seeking you in fellowship with your church. And we pray that you would bless her by your, your word and work in her life. Father, we ask that you would work in all of our lives, our children, as husbands and wives in our marriages. We pray, Father, that you would would strengthen them where there is strife and conflict and and trouble, where there is fear and and areas where they we just don't know how to move forward. We pray that you would meet us there, Lord, and that you would speak to us and and give us all that we need, Father, to be uh, to live together in humility and peace and with great blessing, Lord. We pray that you would grow our children in the faith, that those who have not yet believed, Lord, we pray that you would call to them, they would hear you, and that you would give them, uh, grant them faith and repentance, and uh, Lord, then let us together grow as the body of Christ and into maturity. We ask, Lord, that uh, you would extend and expand our witness as a congregation here in the city that we live in, we pray, Father, that more people would hear the gospel and they would be changed and they would come to know Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, we pray that you would use um, the ministry of our church and the churches we have fellowship with to uh, glorify yourself. And, Lord, we want to lift up to you Early Rain Covenant Church in China this morning as they continue to be harassed by 
their persecutors and the government coming after them. We pray that you would help them to stand strong and to be encouraged in Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would um, use their witness to win the government officials who and the police who bother them. Lord, we pray that you would turn that country upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ and that your church there would stand through this great trial in the triumph and power of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that we would be empowered just now to to hear your voice and to respond in faith to your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying. We're going to uh, stand together now and sing before we hear God's word read. We're going to stand together and sing uh, 488 of the first two stanzas, May the Mind of Christ My Savior. your copy of God's Word and open together with me to Ezekiel chapter 2. If anyone needs a Bible, there's a cart right down the center aisle there. There's a few left, I see. Um, If we run out on the cart, there are some on that back bookshelf also. And uh, you're welcome to stand up and grab one. Ezekiel chapter 2. read all of chapter 2 and into chapter 3, the first three verses. So at the beginning of uh, the book of Ezekiel, we see in chapter 1 the call of the prophet, God calling his prophet who is going to speak his word, um, on, speak God's word on behalf of God uh, to the people. And this is still continuing that the vision that we see here uh, of Ezekiel's call to deliver God's word to God's rebellious people. This is God's word. And he said to me, that's the Lord, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. Then the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet and I heard him who spoke to me and he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day, for they are impudent and stubborn children. I am sending you to them. And you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will be known, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions. Do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. But when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he opened, he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate 
and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. Let's turn together to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Boy, if God's word that's full of woe and lamentations tastes sweet, how sweet is the gospel? The Lord wants us to take his word into us and make it a part of us. What a wonderful theme. We're going to continue our look at 1 Timothy this morning. We're in chapter 4, 6. I'm going to read this to you now, verses 6 through 11. This is God's word. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. Amen. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are delighted to uh, hear your word read. Lord, we pray that we would be even happier to have it explained to us and applied to our lives and that uh, we would receive it for what it is, Lord, that we would uh, become spiritually minded, not just on a Sunday morning, but in every morning and in every day, that we would have the mind of Christ, which is given to us here in your word. We pray for that gift and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. When I was a young man, I uh, started working in uh, restaurants, and I uh, got an opportunity to work in several high-end restaurants. Uh, the first one I worked in was actually at the Coeur d'Alene Resort. It was in room service, and um, the room service office was in the back kitchen of Beverly's, which is on the, in the resort. It's on the seventh floor. It's the five-star restaurant that looks out over the lake. Beautiful setting. And um, it was my experience at the, at the resort that um, opened up to me the opportunity to work at Ron Paul's, which is when I moved to Portland, Oregon in 1995, I got hired on there. And at, at that time, um, Ron Paul's was one of the hottest restaurants in Portland. I moved back to Coeur d'Alene a couple of years later, and I waited tables at two other quality restaurants before heading off to Bible college and, and meeting my wife. Um, all of this to say that I've worked in some quality restaurants and uh, with some very talented chefs. I actually worked with one chef who uh, had spent a year on a yacht as Michael Douglas's uh, personal chef. Um, one of the things I learned from these experiences with, with these chefs is that no two of them are alike. Now, they're, they're all got their own little unique technique or flair or taste, something that's uniquely their own. But one thing all of them have in common, all the chefs that I ever worked with, was that they all love food, right? They they didn't love food just to eat food like you or me. Um, They loved to study food. They they wanted to know everything about food. They, They loved to take the vast variety of foods and flavors that God has created and in an attempt at perfection, to try and blend those things together like Rembrandt blended paint, to make a masterpiece. And every day was to those chefs, every day on the job was another new opportunity to create something that was better than anything that they had ever tasted before, and to then dazzle their patrons, the patrons of their restaurants, with what they served them. So that's what I mean when I said that that chefs love food. I think that's a a good illustration of what Paul is telling Timothy to do here with the word of God in 1 Timothy 4, 6 through 11. For a minister of Jesus Christ to be a good minister, he must 
love the Word of God. He must love the Word of God in a special way. In a way not unlike the way a chef loves food. Now, Paul is, first of all, here talking to Timothy as the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Now, he is a minister of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul used this uh, title for himself in several places. One of them in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, he referred to himself also as a minister of Jesus Christ. And he said there that his responsibility as a minister of Jesus Christ was to preach the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Now, I'll talk more about the word minister in a moment from verse 6. But again, Paul is telling Timothy in verses 6 through 11 how to be a good pastor. However, what Timothy is called to do in these verses is not something that only a pastor is called to do. Now, you can see that there in verse 11, that the things that Paul says here to Timothy as a pastor Timothy is then to command and to teach those things to the whole church. In other words, Pastor Timothy isn't the only one in the church who is called to feast on the word of God. Every Christian is to be commanded and taught these things, Paul says. It's just that Timothy can't command and teach people to feast on the word of God if he himself doesn't first feed feast on the word of God. So I want you to see from these verses here this morning, that that is the thing that Pastor Timothy is being commanded to do by the Apostle of Jesus Christ. And that we too are to make it our business to feast on the Word of God in our everyday lives. And it, this is my point real simple this morning from these verses, is that we are to feast and to get fit on the Word of God in the pursuit of godliness. That's really what I think Paul is getting at here. And I say that we should feast because of what Paul says in verse 6. He says to Timothy, if you instruct the brethren in in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. Instruct the brethren in what things, though? We have to ask that question, right? Uh, We have to remember what Paul has been talking about. Timothy is to instruct the brothers and the sisters in those things, right? And we notice right away that Paul is talking to the church like it's a family. He speaks to them, as he often does, as brethren or or brothers and sisters, which this should, in our mind, take us back to chapter 3, verse 14, where we are told as the church that we are the house of God. We're the household of God. We We are the family of God. And just as children... You resemble your parents, right? Just as children resemble their parents, Christians are to bear the image of their father, our father in heaven. And how do we do that? We do that by becoming like Jesus Christ, who is the image of the father. And so here, Paul is urging Timothy to teach the church these things. Now, this is really interesting. The the word uh, for godliness that is used here um, by Paul Um, It's used uh, 13 times in the New Testament. Nine of them are here in 1 Timothy. Nine nine times. So what Paul is saying here is at the very heart of his message to the church in this letter. It is the pursuit of godliness. But Paul, previous to these verses, has been talking about be careful how you do that. We have to be careful about the way that we pursue godliness. In chapter 3, verse 16, all the way through chapter 4, verse 5, Paul is talking about the the way to godliness, right? And he told us there that the great mystery of godliness, it's nothing like the demonic and man-made godliness that some in the church were teaching. Some in the church were forbidding people from using God-given good things for their own enjoyment. Godliness, Paul taught us there, does not come from treating something like marriage or food or drink or any other created thing as if it were evil. Yes, 
every good thing can be abused, right? And is abused. But the way of godliness is not abandoning all of those things. The way of, in fact, part in part, being godly means learning how to use all of the good things that God has given the way that God would have us to, right? So when Paul tells Timothy, chapter 4, verse 6, to teach these things, it's, he's talking about how to be godly, how to come to this godliness, according to the great mystery of godliness, chapter 3, verse 16. Chapter 3, verse 16 teaches us, as we looked at before, that we become godly by beholding what God has done for us, what God is doing for us through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to rehearse everything that we said there, but again, it, godliness is, is, being, is what we come to by seeing the love of God for us in his Son, Jesus Christ. It's our response to that. And Paul tells Timothy, instruct the brethren in these things. Don't let this church invent for themselves man-made religion and false forms of godliness. And it's interesting how Paul actually says here that Timothy, how Timothy is to do this. Uh, the Greek word translated instruct in verse 6, the, the word is literally means to place below place below. Paul's using a metaphor here. To place below, it's an action that describes what a server does when he waits on tables, setting food before the people who are over that table. Now, Paul is, I'm going to show you, using a food analogy here. And there's two other things that support that, um, that Paul is using a food service metaphor here. First of all, he calls Timothy a minister or servant of Jesus Christ. Now, we, we think of that in a technical sense as a reference to a preacher or a pastor. But here he's using it in its, in, in its he is using it that way here, but in its most basic generic meaning, it is, uh, this Greek word refers to a person who serves tables, a table server. And th so the a server works in this culture, they would have been, this servant would have probably been the property of a master. And it would have been the table server's job to serve the table of the master and to serve the master, to serve the master's family, and to serve the master's guests. But it's a food server. And this is the word that he picks up and applies to a preacher of the word. Now, Paul continues the food analogy by saying that by saying Timothy will be a good servant of Jesus Christ if he has been first nourished in the word of faith. Again, Paul is comparing the God's word to food. We we nourish our bodies on food, right? But we nourish our souls on the word of God, or, or as he says here, the word of faith. What he's getting at there is, is that it is the word of God that leads us to faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul's painting a picture here. Paul is here, he's portraying a pastor as a chef. A chef who prepares a meal, the word of God, and then sets it before the family of God for them to feast on. And Jesus Christ is the master of the house. This is his house. And Paul is merely his, and Paul and Timothy are merely just servants. They're, they're table waiters who serve the, t the children that Jesus Christ has gathered in his father's house around his father's table. And Paul is telling Timothy here that in order to be, to be good at that, he must first of all have been nourished by that same spiritual food himself, right? Actually, the verb that Paul uses here, it's in the present tense, which means the pastor must continually be nourished by the word of faith. And also, he says, the good doctrine that he has been taught by others 
the doctrine that he closely follows. To be a good minister of Jesus Christ, a pastor, must love the word of faith like a chef loves food. It, it must be to him, Paul says here, good. More literally, the word, as we've seen in previous verses, it's the word that means beautiful. Beautiful doctrine. The doctrine that is, the teaching that is found in Scripture must be a beautiful thing to a pastor. He must, in other words, he must be magnetically drawn and attracted to what the Scriptures teach us about God before that man can serve it up to the family of God. And it's that relationship, that kind of relationship to the Word of God that makes a pastor a good chef and a good server of uh, it, and nourishes the people of God with the food of God's word. This also means that this is the way that you, as God's children, should also come to God's house. How you should come to God's word. Remember, teach, command these things, Timothy, to the church too, right? So it's not just Timothy that the word of God is supposed to be uh, to to him and him alone like this. It's, it's for all of us. All of us should come to the word hungry. We should come to the word to be fed and nourished and magnetically drawn to closely follow the beautiful teachings that are found in God's word. You should come to feast on God's word. When you come to his house, come to feast on his word. When talking about the world that God had made uh, for us to live in, G.K. Chesterton said, uh, there aren't any uninteresting things in God's world. There aren't any uninteresting things. There's only uninterested people. And if that's true of the world that God has created for us to live in, how much more is it true of the Word? that brings new creation into this world. There is nothing uninteresting in the Word of God. There is nothing uninteresting about the worship of God that is saturated with the Word of God. There's nothing uninteresting about it. There are only uninterested people. Of course, to see these things, God has to wake us up, doesn't he? He has to wake us up. So let me urge you, if, if you have no interest in feasting on the Word of God and learning more and more about the beautiful teachings of Scripture, beg God. Beg the Lord to give you a taste for these things. Now, being uninterested in God's Word is it's not a sign of spiritual health. It's a sign of spiritual sickness. It is the Word of God that feeds faith. If you have no taste for the word of God, you will spiritually wither and die. So, brothers and sisters, let me challenge you another way. God's word not only teaches beautiful doctrines, but Paul says in another place that they are unsearchably rich and deep. Unsearchably. You will never get to the bottom of the treasures that are found in the word of God. Never. Praise the Lord, both now and for forever. You should, and so we should come to the ministry of the word again, wanting to go deeper, wanting to know God and his word better than we have before, to keep going into it deeper and deeper. So you should order your server, your, your table waiter, you should order him to make sure that he serves up and places before you something deep, something challenging, and I would even say something that is hard to understand. Now read the book of Romans. If you haven't read the book of Romans, read the book of Romans. Paul wrote, the Spirit of God inspired Paul to write that letter to a church full of people who hadn't been Christians for very long. It's a deep book, isn't it? Right? That's not Gerber baby food, right? I mean, it is a robust complex piece of spiritual meat. And you got to chew, you got to work. 
It takes a lot of effort to chew on that word and to ingest it and to be nourished by it. I think it's inter- interesting in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, that the Apostle Peter spoke of the letters of the Apostle Paul. And he said that, yeah, this Paul, in some of his letters, there are these things that are hard to understand. They're hard to understand. There are places in Scripture, there are things said in Scripture that are hard to understand, but it's okay. It's not going to hurt you. God will take us into it. He'll, He'll take us deeper, and we should want that. We should come here with that hope, with that desire. Now, the apostles of Jesus Christ, they served up hearty, meaty meat and potatoes, right? Well, what does it say about us, though? I mean, just looking at the, the average American Christian, the average American church, and we see, if you look at what's being ingested out there, it's a spiritual diet. It's more like marshmallow fluff, right? It's really kind of easy to, to, to go down. A TV and I think our devices have conditioned us to be passive. Passive. I don't want to act, actively sit and think and and have to chew on something. Uh, we've become content with people telling us a bunch of cliches and uh, giving us a short list of practical things to do. As if that was the nourishment that God provides us in his word. Now Paul teaches us here, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. The ministry of the word in God's house should push you to grow. It should be challenging to you. And it's not surprising then that Paul tells Timothy here in verse 7 then to reject the junk food. Reject the spiritual junk food that is out there. Look at how he says it. The uh, reject profane teachings. How does he say it? Reject profane and old wives' fables. Uh, it's teaching that is like, an, well, the word profane there literally means empty. Things that are empty. There's no substance to them. What are old wives' fables? But they're sentimental, uh, sappy things that we don't know whether they're true or not. We don't know. They might make you laugh and feel good, but they're just stories, right? Now, there are, uh, hey, have you ever been to church? Been to church and somebody read a verse or two, and then it was just story after story after story after story? Right? We, we should demand that that never be done. As the people of God, you should, you should demand that what is served up to you through the ministry of the word by your table server is something that is going to nourish you profoundly and lead you more deeply to know Jesus Christ and to walk with him. Now, these other things, they might be entertaining. They might keep, maybe they keep our attention better, right? Stories keep our, uh, great storytelling. I tell stories here every now and then. But, you know, those things might hold our attention, but it's empty if it doesn't have some deep spiritual truth that's just straightforwardly explain what God has said and to apply it to our lives. Now, we don't want empty stuff, right? What we want is to have our hearts and minds filled up with the deep things of God because God tells us his things that he has to say to us are deep. They're unsearchably rich. So if you aren't getting a mental and spiritual workout uh, through the ministry of the word when you're in God's house, something's wrong. Something's wrong. And Paul tells Timothy next in verses 7 through 9, he says, exercise yourself towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance. Now this is now the third faithful saying that we've come across in 1 Timothy. First one, chapter 1, verse 15. The second one, chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, so let me remind you what a faithful saying is. And it likely was a concise statement of Christian truth that was well known uh, among the churches in the, in the time of the apostles. 
It is a saying that is faithful to the truth of God's word. And if you accept it, it will make you faithful too. So make it your own. Accept it. Every Christian is to accept the challenge Paul gives to Timothy here as a way of walking more faithfully with Jesus Christ. So don't be a a, a couch potato Christian. What's a couch potato Christian? I mean by that, a couch potato Christian is one who watches other people walk more closely with Jesus Christ like they watch other people living life on reality TV. You might think you're a part of it, but you're really not. You're just watching it all go by. You're watching other people live it. Other people do it. And some Christians come to the ministry of the word not to have God work in them and spiritually nourish them and build them up. Some come just because this is just what Christians do, right? It's Sunday, so we're here again. Now, sometimes, you know, we can you know, come, you can be stirred by a, a quote or uh, maybe a, a good illustration. Uh, maybe it's something about another Christian taking the word of faith seriously. I often use illustrations of, of Christians that have the Lord is used to do extraordinary things. And, and we can hear those illustrations and we can even be moved by them, emotionally stirred by them. But we shouldn't confuse being emotionally stirred about somebody else taking Jesus seriously as we ourselves taking Jesus seriously. The saying, Paul says, is worthy of acceptance by all. What Paul's getting at here isn't just for for the serious Christians. Because all Christians are to be serious about the things that Paul says here. When you come to the word of God, it is to exercise yourself towards godliness. I love it. Paul switches the metaphor here, right? Switches the metaphor. Instead of comparing the ministry of the word uh, to being nourished by food, he now compares the ministry of the word to the agony of physical exercise. I say agony because in verse 10, that's the very Greek word that Paul uses. There in verse 10, he says, for to this end or or for to this goal, that is for the goal of godliness, for the goal of godliness, we labor. Anogizomai. Agony. Anogizomai. It is, and that we suffer reproach to, to live a, Paul's saying, to live a life that reflects what, what Paul calls godliness, it is going to be hard and it's going to hurt. It's going to be some pain involved. And just like you can't be an excellent athlete without exercising like few people exercise, so too you can't attain godliness without the painful exercise Paul is talking about here. The kids. What do we mean by godliness? What does Paul mean by godliness? Now the Greek word Paul uses here that's translated godliness, it means to have a profound respect for someone that compels you to devote yourself to them. So young people, imagine imagine how you would act if you're, let's say, your favorite athlete or uh, uh, maybe a celebrity that you, you follow. What if they showed up at your house to talk to you? W- would you ignore them and play the Xbox instead? Well, of course you wouldn't, right? You wouldn't be able to take your eyes off of the person. You, you wouldn't be able to do anything. You would hang on there every day, right? You would do whatever they asked you to do. That's what the godliness Paul speaks of here is like. It is to be by Jesus Christ in such a way that you you can't take your eyes off of him. It is to, to hang on his every word. It is to, to give him whatever he asks for. 
It is to give him everything. Because no one and nothing compares to him. No one and nothing is more important to you than him. That's what Paul is talking about here. This godliness, it is devotion to someone who has profoundly impacted your life. That's what the godliness Paul speaks of is. That's what it's like. So we have to be awed by Jesus Christ, don't we? And we have to go back to the mystery of godliness in chapter 3, verse 16, which is, again, about us seeing the glory of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So what is godliness? It's, it's a well-formed faith. Godliness is the lived expression of believing that no one and nothing is better than Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul can signal in chapter 6, verse 6, that godliness and contentment go hand in hand. But godliness requires agonizing exercise. Because the things that are most important to us by nature are earthly things that can be seen, right? Now, those are the kinds of things that we naturally tend to devote ourselves to. Earthly things that we can see. You can literally watch the pounds fall off your waistline after committing to watch Sweat into the Oldies with Richard Simmons for a week. Now, you can see how much your flexed deltoid muscle has grown in the mirror after flipping over tires or cars or whatever it is that they do at CrossFit. Now, you can easily measure the growth of your retirement account or your savings after you've gotten serious and you start socking away that, that your two times a day latte money. You can see it. We'll do hard things, won't we, today, for things that we can see, things that we can attain. Right? If we know that at the end of this uh, next year of hard times saving money is going to culminate in a European vacation, we can do it. We can do it. We can strive in life to reach goals like a physically fit body and go to extraordinary lengths to accomplish it. Paul doesn't say that's worthless. But he does say here it profits us a little. A little. But godliness is profitable, he says, for all things in life now and for the life which is to come. But we will meet with far, far more resistance when we pursue godliness than when we're trying to get some rock-hard abs. I mean, gravity, barbells, weight machines, they, they'll strain you when you physically exercise. But as you spiritually exercise, demons are assaulting you with lies, with lying messages that are meant to lure you away from the truth of God's word. That's really happening. The unbelieving world around us uh, will set before us these false promises of having our best life now. And our, our hearts, even as Christians, can become divided, right? Our hearts can become divided. And we know that Jesus said that no one can serve two masters, but we start thinking, yeah, but maybe I could be the first one. Maybe I could pull it off. You know, I think I might be able to do that. Now, no need to raise your hand. But when it's time to gather with the body of Christ for worship on the Lord's Day, have you ever felt like you'd just rather stay home and have a late breakfast rather than go and hear a sermon? I know the answer to that question. We are our own greatest obstacle to the godliness that we are to exercise ourselves towards. So in order to have our life controlled by an awe, and a love for Jesus Christ, you will have to push through resistance greater than any exercise machine could ever exert upon you. And it's going to hurt. And that's why it's helpful that the Spirit gives us some wonderful encouragement here that helps spur us on in this struggle. Now, I already mentioned to you verse 8. Godliness is profitable in all things. 
the, the benefit of anything else that we might strive for today will only touch small areas of our lives, and it will be temporary at best, right? Physically fit people, uh, sorry to say, they still have uh, broken relationships. Physically fit people still experience financial disasters. They still get MS and cancer. They still die. Physical exercise cannot save anyone from the fear of death. All the success in the world can't stop the anxiety. It can't stop the panic that overtakes a person when they get that creeping feeling that something, that maybe everything in life is just meaningless. And that's just it. Everything in life is meaningless if you do not have a right relationship with the God who made you. If you don't possess the promise that you will have what every person in the entire world wants more than anything else. Do you know what that is? Kids? What does every person who's ever lived want more than anything else? Everyone wants to live forever. We want to live forever in a place that is, ev- that is just the way it's supposed to be. Everybody wants that. And you can run the fastest marathon. You can have enough to retire comfortably and vacation when you want to. You can have the most friends on Facebook or the most followers on Instagram. But if you don't have the promise that you will be saved from death and live in perfect blessedness forever, if you don't have that, the rest of your life in the back of your mind, you know that your good days are numbered. You know that your best days are probably behind you, not in front of you. And you know that you're already dying. But when you exercise yourself toward godliness, nothing and no one will be more important to you than Jesus Christ. And then, as Paul says in verse 8, you have the promise, the promise of life that now is and that which is to come. Godliness is knowing and relating to Jesus Christ like he is your all in all. Because he really is. That's who he is. Whether we realize it or not. And what do you have in him? You have eternal life. Is there anything more valuable than that? Now, what could be more valuable, practically speaking, for everyday life than knowing Jesus Christ as the most important person and the most important possession that you have? If you know that you will live with Jesus Christ forever, if you know that he will make all things new just the way that they're supposed to be, if you know that, nothing that you go through in this life Nothing that you experience in this life can overcome you. Nothing. Now, how much is that worth, you guys? It's worth everything. That's the answer. It's worth everything. And this is one of those places in Scripture that John Bunyan wrote about to a friend when he, he's sitting in a prison for 13 years for preaching the gospel, and he's writing letters, and he wrote about the value from that prison cell, the value of the promises that God has made to those who trust in his son, Jesus Christ. And Bunyan said, I tell thee, friend, there are some promises that the Lord has helped me to lay hold of Jesus Christ through and by that I would not have taken out of the Bible for as much gold and silver as can lie between York and London piled up to the stars. You see, as Paul will say in chapter 6, verse 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. There's nothing more profitable than godliness. You, You could not enrich your heart, 
your mind and your life better than striving to know and believe that there is nothing and no one more important than Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul labored and he suffered reproach, he says there in verse 10. He says, we trusted the living God who is infinitely more trustworthy than the dead world and all of its lies and messages. God has promised life to those who listen to him. Now, what does this world have to promise to us? The world can't keep itself alive. Now, people can do nothing to guarantee life, safety, or prosperity to themselves or to their neighbors. No one. But you know what? When Paul wrote this letter, there actually was a one man who claimed that he could, that he could give these kinds of things to people who followed him. Uh, Caesar, the emperor, promised life and peace to all who submitted to him as king. And in the city of Ephesus, where Timothy is when he receives this letter from Paul, um, we have found inscriptions that say this, to Claudius Caesar, the savior of of all men. Does that sound familiar? It is in the Greek, word for word, the same as what Paul says of the Lord, of the living God, in verse 10. So Paul's not saying here that God saves all men. He's saying no man. Not even Caesar himself can promise life. No man can save us from death, but except the God who became a man to overcome death. The only Savior in the world is the living God, and only those who believe in him will be saved. Are you believing in him? He's the Savior of all men. The only Savior of all men. Are you believing in him? He's the only man that is ever triumphed over death, never to die again, who lives today. He is the living God. And so physical exercise is not going to save you. Vitamins aren't going to save you. Doctors aren't going to save you. The government is not going to save you. Technology is not going to save you. Conservative news anchors are not going to save you. So don't spend the best you have giving yourselves to those things. Give your best and most to knowing Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the promise of life. Feast on his word. Get fit on his word. So that nothing and no one in this life is more important to you than him. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful that you challenge us. Lord, as we read together from your word earlier, that you you discipline those that you love. You discipline your children. And Lord, there are often things in your word that challenge us and that correct us. And we're thankful because it shows us that you love us, that you are our Father and that you care that you are near. And we thank you, Father, that the, the kind of life that you call us into is one of knowing Jesus Christ more and more and being awed by him and loving him. For there is nothing and no one greater than him. It's in his name that we thank you and pray. And amen. Well, we are going to stand.